Yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, look, as mentioned, I'm the, come from a systems background and I want to take this back a bit and I want to talk about the importance of setting everything up and uh, really structuring um, a, a data system. And it's not just so we can have nice data, it's actually the outcome in an exploration model is to discover something, right? So if anyone wants to know, that's up in our um, uh, Hakira project up in the Peruvian Andes, quite a nice spot, although it does take about eight hours to drive up there, so you need a book. Um, right, so industry buzz at the moment is data analytics, machine learning, AI, and it's all how we all aid discovery, okay? I'm just gonna um, throw a few things, things out there about this, so one, it's not science fiction, you know. I, I really do like this uh, movie title because I can picture the leeches sucking out information, you know, feeding it into the systems, and that's what it's really about, right? So, but one thing to remember is you can't teach a machine to do something you don't really know how to do, but you can teach it to do it faster and a larger sample size, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to feed as much information as possible into our systems and get them to a decision point. Okay, so let's talk about a few fundamentals. So AI, machine learning, that's, that's basically the end point, right? That's where we all want to go as uh, scientists. But what it requires is a really solid data quality foundation. So we need integrated systems, quality data, and, and that's really the, the foundation to the decision or the discovery process. So really that whole crap in, crap out thing has really been made, um, has gone a step further now that if we don't have quality data, then our decisions can't expect it to be quality either, right? And one thing I always like to talk about is that automation turns data into knowledge. So we've got data and we've got knowledge, right? Real-time collection systems reduce the time to decision points. Now, these decision points aren't for myself as a systems guy to decide what they are. That's for the exploration scientists and that's for the geosciences to decide what those decisions are. And they, they can be discovery, they could be um, coming back of killing a project or, or um, moving a drill rig, could be anything. Those decisions are up to primarily probably most of the people in this room, right? Our job is to get that information to those decision points. And basically, data must be delivered at the time a decision is required, so after it's too late. So really, if if you're getting data after the um, decision point, then it's just data. But if you're getting it at the decision point, then it becomes knowledge. And that's um, why I asked the question about, isn't it better to have um, data that's unorganized and potentially rubbish, but let the people using it decide if it's rubbish or not? Um, right. So um, let's look at uh, a bit of a traditional flow. And when I mean traditional, I probably mean, you know, uh, a few years back, or, or some people might still be doing this, but potentially a, a, a traditional data flow is the science is applied after the collection, and a, a static decision point is reached at the end of the process. Right, so it's a, it's a three-stage linear process. So data collection, data processing, science interpretation, decision, okay? Now, what that means is, is that the collection is driving the decision. And what that generally means is we get to the end of this decision and then we go, oh, crap, we need to go back into the field and collect more information, right? And then begin that whole three-stage linear process again. What, what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce the, the time to those decision points. So what we want to do is we want to try to get into, and when I say what we want to do, this is, this is the philosophy that we're taking in, in first quantum exploration. Um, is we're trying to create a real-time data flow where the science is applied during the collection and the decision points are reached during the collection. So you can see that the time is reduced to decision, but also these arrows how they indicate that we're learning as we're going. Okay, so we're collecting information, we're making decisions on the fly. So rather than do our 10 drill hole program, and then decide, oh, we should have really moved from hole three onwards, we should have moved over to the east, well, you can actually decide that as you're going because you're collecting that information. So you're dynamically making decisions on the fly. Okay? So, yeah, you're continually feeding data into real time, removes post-field processing stages and allows automation. 
Okay? Decision points that control the campaign itself can be reached faster with more knowledge. So I've got an example of infill sampling there. So that first picture that I showed at our Kira, and in the Andes, it, it, I'm sure a lot of you have, have worked there, there's a lot of community leaders. To get access to ground, you've got to talk to potentially 30 community leaders and get everyone to agree, right? So that can take three, six, sometimes even nine months, right? So if you're doing, um, and, and traditionally, if you're doing a soil sampling program or something like that, and you get permission to access the ground, if you're doing a traditional way, you do your soil sampling, and then you come back and go, all right, we've got to go back and do infill sampling, OK? Where, and then it's go through the process of three, six, nine months of getting permission to go back. Whereas if you're doing this and you're identifying some copper moly anomalies or something like that as you're going, you can, you can reduce the space for those anomaly areas and, and infill as you're going, not requiring that repeat visit. Or you still might do, but you're reducing the time to decision. So that's just an example. So what's happening now is the decision is driving the collection. And that's exactly what, what we think it, it, it should be. Um, rather than the other way of the, of the collection driving the decision. So basically, decision points are resolved dynamically, and this results in a more um, advanced decision, and that's things like killing a project, moving a drill rig, rather than, oh, we don't know as much, we better go back and start the process again. Okay, so we've all seen these graphs before. Um, I don't want to harp on this too much. I think this is a really good one that shows that the... Um, industry is discovering less and spending more to make smaller discoveries. All right, we're all very aware of that. So you can see around 2015, um, I mean, the industry went pear, right? Is that a good way of, of uh, explaining it? Um, but what that means is, in the downturns of actually in the minerals industry, it actually makes group like Sequent and, and other software groups actually rethink their approach. And, and the downturn in the minerals industry a lot of time breeds innovation. So in 2015, along came the, uh, the API integration bus. Now, if anyone's a fan of really bad early 90s pop, I keep thinking of the, the Venga bus is coming. I don't know if anyone remembers that song. But, um, but basically, um, really, what, what that means is, is that, you know, Software groups, I found, these are my observations, you know, um, but basically um, they started thinking about collaboration in a space. And we'll go on to some of my observations on the next slide, but basically APIs started to be taken seriously about connecting into different softwares. So really, if anyone's not sure what an API is, it's an application program interface, but pretty much in general terms, instead of clearly defined methods of communication among various components, meaning companies are open up in their software for other people to come in and collaborate and have live interaction with them. Okay? So let's look at some of those um, observations that I personally saw uh, in 2015 onwards, is that there was an integration focus shift. So traditionally, software groups saw isolation of products as a protection mechanism in the 90s and 2000s and things like that, right? But there was a, a realisation that a prerequisite for survival was to do more than just sell software. And, some, and, and what, they, what I saw as companies wanted to do is they wanted to sell a workflow or a or decision-making tool, OK? Um, the next one is the responsibility shift. So as a systems person, I was called on to do all the um, integration internally myself. And in 2015, we had 80% reduction in, in expiration of staff and budget, but we're still expected to you know, um, provide the same results. So we, we had a very small team. So histori historically, the responsibility of data integration between flat platforms was based internally with the expiration group, okay, which is as I mentioned, the same group that was asking to do more with less, all right? Now, the benefits and the outcomes. Um, system, the benefits and the outcomes is, is that this all takes a long time. Due to lack of automation and data interruptibility, then system integration takes a long time, right? You're constantly battling with file formats, all that kind of stuff. And that, that to me, is the whole, that's old school, right? 
we shouldn't have to worry about file formats. We sh software just talk should talk to each other. Okay. So one thing that I, I noticed, or maybe I'm saying I noticed that because I'm trying to convince everyone, but um, with the responsibility of the APIs or, or the collaboration moving more to the software groups, um, I believe exploration groups could focus more on the science and their internal strategy to ultimately discovery. Um, basically, the system integration is no longer seen as an exploration's IP. Okay? That's just connecting stuff together. Right? Whereas I think in the past we've all thought about, oh, if we have iGas connected to um, Central and we use it together, then that's our IP. Well, that's just two bits of data talking to each other. Right? And what it also does is allows smaller innovation groups to connect their products into larger established um, software groups and leverage their user base. So we've seen a lot of third party um, smaller groups bring, bring their wares to people like Sean at Sequid and say, hey, we want to get on board. Right? And, and it becomes a lot, it becomes more of a software community that we can buy into rather than having to buy into just the sequent plan or the GSoft pipeline, right? We can start to pick and choose and get them talking to each other. So here's a bit of a flow, workflow diagram of um, the exploration system integration. There's a few things missing off there like ASD and all that. We do all that as well. It's just a bit of an overview. And um, I want to emphasize that this, I'm not saying you have to use all these specific softwares, but a lot of these softwares have come from what we already had in place. And it's about going to each of those groups, talking to them, and, and seeing how they can interact to each other, and, and, and get the software companies to do the work for you. All right? Do the integration, get APIs and things like that happening. So, what I really want to focus on is that, you know, the title of my talk, very facetious title, I suppose, but the cloud discovery, right? That is an exploration group's IP. That is what you, that is what your company thinks why you guys are the um, undercover, special, undercover specialists of the world, right? It's what's going to find you an all body before someone else said potentially. That is your IP. This around it it's just software connecting to each other. That should not be considered as IP. That's my personal opinion. And you can see that I've quite happily, you know, put my money where my mouth is and I've chucked up the type of software that we're using um, internally within the group. Now, I'm a big fan of, of um, I might, I might uh, call it communicating with software groups. Software groups might mention hassling maybe in a different... Um, limelight, but the concept is every single one of these we've sat down with and we've, um, they're on our system, one, because we already had them internally and we all know changing a system can be a, a, a training nightmare, a budget nightmare, so it's sitting down with them and working out how they can all integrate into each other to get data as quickly as possible to this centrepiece so we can make real-time decisions, okay? So... You can see that at the, at the bottom here, we've got the whole um, GIS fuel collection through Discover Mobile. I do want to emphasise also that not all of this is in place yet. This is our, this is our roadmap, and uh, we're trying to achieve this. So things might come on or, or, or pop off as, as they're needed. Um, so you can see we've we got the surface collection, we've got our, our, our downhole logging, we've got our direct from rig stuff. We've got auto assay loading that we've developed. Um, we've got Power BI displaying metrics, all that kind of stuff. And up here, we've got some uh, imagery stuff and also Leapfrog Central in the middle and um, Leapfrog Geo there. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into those a bit more on how they work. But you know what I wanted to show is that by, by mapping out this, this path, if you like, or this workflow, and talking with companies, what we can do is we can get any other third party company to, to jump in here, because one of the critical things about this type of system is a good SQL backend database at the moment. SQL is the, is the thing at the moment, right? Maybe in the future it won't be SQL, but at the moment, we need to get all our data going as quickly as we can into our SQL database, and on the other hand, you can see this box in the middle, all the arrows point into a 
collaboration decision-making tool. So LeapFrog Central, to us, sure, it stores your versioning of models and you know where your, your, your latest, greatest point of truth is, that's great. But really, it's decision-making and collaboration tool, which is what Clint was speaking about before that really got us involved um, in LeapFrog Central, not because we can just store our models. That's just a, a, a bonus. So, we can, so the, the good thing about this is when a, a small group comes to us, and this, these guys are an example, we can say, yeah, man, your stuff looks really good, but does it integrate with this and this? And we can say, if you want to be on this uh, roadmap or cloud of discovery, then um, you know, have a chat with them and see what you can do. So that's, that's, it, it's really us as an, uh, as an exploration group trying to drive that collaboration at the same time. Right, so if we look at the... If we look at the um, sort of four pillars, if you like, you know, so we've got our surface um, collection, um, uh, downhole collection, so Discover Mobile, LogChief, all coming into Datashed. Um, we've got our assays loading into Datashed through dispatch and automatic loading through SharePoint. So as soon as something hits an email, they end up in the, in the right database. That's, you know, assays is one of the most important things. The quicker you get into the database, the better. Okay, we've got, we're, we're heading down the, the reflex path with our um, uh, direct from rig, PIC, PXRF and um, DDRs and all that kind of information, so we can start to get metrics about that. I mean, a lot of people think DDRs is about invoicing and, and schedule of rates, but, you know, the petroleum industry already uses that type of information for penetration rates, for hardness of rocks, for identifying litho lithological boundaries and all those kinds of things, right? I think that's something that... that that if we, if we start to collect all this data, if someone wants to use penetration rates in here as a decision-making tool, we've, we've already started to collect it. So by collecting it, that's an example of, you don't know what decisions you want yet, but if you start to build a system that just gets all the data into the middle bit straight away, then that's, that's uh, the best thing. Over here, we, we're, we're embarking on this, so we've got that happening in a few groups. Um, and uh, we're aiming to um, get that um, into our system as well. So as you can see, what we're moving away from is these static sort of collections, and we're moving into these... Uh, the reason why I've called it the cloud discovery, because we're really moving into these collaboration third-party tools that we're, we're um, working with those groups collabor collaboratively um, to see if they can feed into our systems. OK? So the responsibility of getting that data to the database and the central decision points is not just ours, right? We can go along, we can pick a group and go along with the ride with them and, uh, you know, slightly nudge them to move faster. Um, now, again, LeapFrog Geo is something we use across our, our whole exploration group um, on an on-demand licensing setup and, you know, central's really started to take off in the last year that we've been using it. Um, it's moved away from, from the first central thing of version control to decision making, collaboration, discussions, that kind of thing. Okay? So let's look at some of the major components to get a, to get a bit of an idea about collaboration and integration. Um, so, you know, data direct from rigs. So you can have all your planned holes right in the field. And, and I'll jump back just a touch. Um, you know, I'm not sure how many small expression groups or low-budget expression groups are out there, but one of the biggest problems of a systems person, as I have, is, is the lack of managers wanting to pay for internet in the bush, right? What this has done, by introducing these types of integration techniques, it's actually made the necessity for Wi-Fi to not become a budget problem, and it's not, oh yeah, maybe we should pay for Wi-Fi, it, that's just becoming an operating cost. So one of the big things I've focused on in the last few years is that um, any problem with the system shouldn't be a system problem, it should be a budget problem. Oh, but we don't have internet in the field. But you can, just pay for it, right? So really, setting up something that feeds everything in and you can bring it back to a, a budget issue where you go, well, you can have that, we're ready to go, okay? Um, just pay for bloody internet. Is, is that okay to say? <laughs> um, so really, so what we could do, what we start to do with, um, you know, some of the decision-making that we can do in the field 
is that we can have all our planned holes in, um, in uh, Leaf Frog Central. We could be pushing all our surveys for the reflex system and potentially as we're drilling, we can have our drill hole trace appearing um, in our model so we can see the deviation from the planned hole. So why is that important? Well, for two things. Getting your survey data in straight away means you've got a base of a, of a, a drill trace where as you start to get other information pushed into LeapFrog Central, that can attach to that downhole survey, right? So your downhole surveys are the first things that you need to get in. You need a drill trace to attach other data downhole, gamma, um, whatever, right? So what that does for a decision process, for example, is you can really start to say, oh, wow, look, we're deviating off this plant hole. Let's stop drilling at 400 metres rather than 1,000 metres, right? So straight away, you don't have to wait to the end of the project to realise that the last eight holes we did were all off. Okay, so you can move, you can, you can cancel that hole quicker, right? You can also move that third hole 80 metres to the east or something like that and you can really start to get an idea of targeting, okay, in the field in real time. Um, of course, you know, um, there's other things about, and, and that's the example I said about getting your survey and information and drill hole trace down in the model. Um, you can start to attach things like structural information, stuff like that in real time as well, okay? And, and like I said, there's lots of tools out there that do all these things, but the big thing for us is having LeapFrog Central as a... Uh, as, as that central um, communication piece to bring all this real-time information in. Okay, the next one is an example of um, Imago. We're starting to, you know, the world's about imagery, right? The future is about imagery. So, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> up until we started bringing this in, you know, our core photos get taken, they get put on the server, um, they're low res, what do they get used for? But in the future, you know, you, you're, going to, you're going to be having machine learning and, and uh, AI on imagery. It's not going to be on vectorized data, right? It's going to be on imagery, spectrometry, uh, Landsat, everything, right? We already do a lot of that. Okay, so the, the thing is, this is the example I, want, I, I wanted to show this one is because these guys have integrated bringing this information down hole in LeapFrog, okay? So if we're potentially at, uh, taking core photos at the rig, then we could be uh, bringing them straight into our model along our plotted servo, for example, right? Now, the thing about this is, is um, and, and I say up here with potential machine learning, I know that, um, there's, a, there's a couple of Amargo representatives in the crowd, but really, in our conversations with these guys, they really start talking about, you know, when you've got that information in high res and available in a cloud environment, then the machine learning that comes is you teach the machine on how to recognise a massive sulphide and then say, go to town and show me where else that massive sulphide zone is in the group. These are the type of things that, the decisions that we want to try to get to. But I emphasise again, I'm not there making those decisions and you probably, heard, you probably noticed from a few things I've said, I'm not, I'm not uh, I am a systems guy, I'm not a geo or anything like that. So, um, so whatever you guys want to do, that's fine. But if we don't have all this information feeding into the, into the centralised system, you guys can't do that, right? And that's our job is not to make the decisions, but provide the real-time data so you guys can make the decisions. All right. So um, this is sort of uh, the crux of what we, our philosophy around um, decision-making uh, an integration in LeapFrog Central. So, um, like I mentioned, it is a 3D communication and decision-making platform, real-time decision-making and scenario modelling. So let's, let's talk about the... Uh, I'd, I'd used that phrase of traditional versus real-time before. Let's talk about the traditional um, process uh, of modelling. Um, so if we take just this first leg here, Right, and if we white out the next one, single scenario. So, you know, our, our scenario generally is that what we do is a whole heap of geos get together, they put on the boxing gloves, big shouting match, whose idea is going to win, right? And then we model that scenario. Then we get to the end and we go, oh crap, 
and then we come back again and we start again. What we envisage Lee Frog Central can help us do is put all those um, geologist ideas and hypothesis and model them up at the same time, which is great, right? Five geologists, seven opinions, you know, we all know that stuff. So put all seven opinions in there. Model them up, see which one wins, okay? But, so the concept that we're trying to get to is with the branches and things like that, is that we model all these scenarios, and one of these scenarios could be that it's a hinge system versus a fault, no, it's the same thing, isn't it? A folded system versus a thrusted system or something like that, right? Um, and, and we can put those scenarios in. Now, the, you, you see here that I've got these little targets and they're field tests. So the concept of this scenario um, uh, modelling is, multiple scenarios, is which scenario or which multiple scenarios can get us to the quickest field test. Now, in our industry, I think we still think of a field test as a positive. Let's hit a massive sulphide zone and, you know, be the winners, but 99%, 99% failure rate or 0.01% discovery rate means that ultimately what we're trying to do in the industry is we're trying to kill things, right? So which we could use this in a way of which field tests are going to allow us to disprove three or four of these decisions, okay? And start to get to the last standing branch. That last standing branch doesn't mean you've got discovery, but what it does mean is that we can start to cross off these scenarios and we can get to the ultimate decision quickly, which is killing a project quickly, right? Getting onto the next one, turning over projects, okay? So, I mean, uh, the ultimate scenario is we go cross, 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 drill, bam, Escondido, right? But, you know, it's not necessarily going to happen. So, how can we get rid of this project in um, six months rather than three years? That type of thing. All right? So, anyway, big question at the bottom is, what else can we connect through Central? What I mean by that is, is any other data we have, we want to visualise it and have it together in Central with everything else. So, uh, wrapping up, cloud discovery. The IP of an exploration group should lie within the strategy of discovery, not within the integration system. So there's a very simple diagram. Connect all your stuff together and insert your exploration strategy in the middle which I'm not going to tell you what it is. You guys already know that. So thank you. <laughs>